Hi, welcome to the seminar series, Planning for the Future of Your Business. This series is presented by Stites and Harbison and the Kentucky Small Business Development Center. I'm Kelly Rosenbaum, I'm an attorney in the firm's Lexington office, and I practice in the Corporate and Business Services Group. And I'm David Longenecker, I'm an attorney in the Lexington office of Stites and Harbison, I practice in the Business Services Group. I counsel businesses and the people who run them. This is webinar one, Choosing the right legal structure for your business and common pitfalls to avoid. Today we are going to cover four general topics. The first is why do I need a legal entity? The second is organizational structures of corporations and LLCs. Third, when do I need a legal entity? And fourth, what type of entity will work best for my business? I'm going to start us off by talking about why do I need a legal entity. The most common primary counsel we give to people in the operation of their business is at the outset of the operation of the business, do I need a legal entity first? Uh, and then why? And, and then once we clear that threshold, assuming we've identified a need uh, for some kind of legal entity uh, that's accepted by the client, uh, uh, we start to consider what, what form of legal entity might make sense. And so as a preliminary question, someone walks in and says, do I need a legal entity? Uh, it's, it, for, for the most part, the answer is going to be probably. Uh, and the biggest reason why the answer is probably is liability protection. Uh, a person who just goes into business places at risk all of the assets of that that person might own uh, for the risks of operation of the business unless they do something to protect it. So what do I mean by that? Uh, if I decide I'm going to open a gas station and in order to do that, to, 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 to commence operation of my gas station, I personally go out and buy the land uh, on which the station will operate uh, and the gas pumps and all of the stuff you put inside your gas station and obtain a business license personally uh, and turn on the lights and start doing business, that's fine. You can do that. And lots of people do. And so the problem with that is that the operation of that gas station exposes all of the assets of that individual to the risks of operation. So if someone comes in and hurts themselves, slips on the floor of the gas station, uh, and suffers serious injury, then the assets of the individual business owner are exposed to the liabilities that may arise from the operation of the business. If that's not a problem for the, the operator of the business, then the, li the potential liability shield that could be obtained from the organization of an entity to operate that business isn't going to be beneficial. That's not the case for most people. Most people find it unacceptable to expose assets not associated with the operation of a business to the risks that arise in the operation of that business. And so what do you do? Well you seek the advice of a lawyer or you get on the internet and try to identify uh, a form of entity that will provide you with the liability uh, protection that organization in a legal entity can provide. That's the primary reason uh, why the answer to why do I need a legal entity uh, uh, exists because there's a liability shield that can be obtained uh, through organization of an entity. In general, both uh, corporations and LLCs provide that liability shield. There are other kinds of legal entities, partnerships, for example, limited partnerships, uh, sole proprietorships, corporations, LLCs, uh, and, and there, are, there are reasons why there are attributes, advantages, and disadvantages for each of those forms of legal entities. But for most companies, most businesses, uh, the avenue that we most frequently direct 
a business is down the road of a corporation uh, or a limited liability company. There are certain uh, types of business uh, uh, where a limited partnership might make sense, but for the most part, for purposes of this series, what, what most of the people who are going to be watching this are, are going, to, going to be directed to, it's a corporation or an LLC. Uh, it seems like in today's world, we counsel clients uh, much more frequently toward an LLC, but there are circumstances that may exist in which a corporation might make sense. And, and it really, in order to make an assessment as to what of those might make sense for, for your business, uh, you're, you're, it's, we'd, we'd have to know a lot more specific facts about the, the ultimate destination of that business in order to make that decision. But for, for the most part, an LLC or a corporation is the, the most typical choice, and either one of those uh, uh, organizational choices would afford the owners and operators of that business with liability protection, assuming that the entity uh, has been organized in an appropriate and correct way, and then, then uh, uh, proper corporate formality uh, is observed in the operation of the business such that the liability shield is preserved. It, it's not enough just to form the entity, uh, put the documents necessary for the formation on the shelf, and move on down the road. Uh, typically, it's not enough. What we're trying to do is create a shield that is insulated from successful attack. Uh, an attack on the owners of a legal entity uh, is commonly known as an attempt to pierce the corporate veil. What does that mean? That's a term of art. Pierce the corporate veil. The corporate veil is this liability shield to which I've been referring. And so an effort to pierce the corporate veil would be an effort to get behind that liability shield to, to uh, reach to the assets of the owners and operators of the business for risks that arise in the operation of the business. The, the legal structure that we try to counsel clients to have uh, is the shield. And so in order to have that shield, uh, you've got to form the ent entity properly, and then you've got to observe basic corporate formalities. What does that mean? That means you hold meetings, you do business in the name of the company, you have company bank accounts through which all of the business activities are conducted. You properly capitalize the company against or for the risks of its operation. You obtain insurance. There are other things that you can do along the way, but the, the primary thing is you act like a business. And David, I think also what's important there that people often fail to do is when you're ordering your business cards or your letterhead to make sure that you have that LLC or that ink in the name of your company. Um, some people don't like the way that that looks, but it's really important in publishing to the world, the outside world, that this is a limited liability entity. So that's yeah, another. Kelly, you raise a good point. I, I think it's in, she, she phrases it exactly correctly. It's important that the when the when the business that's been formed into a legal entity communicates with the world and transacts business with the world, that the world understands that it, it, they are transacting business with. Uh, an entity that has liability protection uh, for, for its owners. And so in terms of why do I need, need a legal entity, there are other reasons. Uh, you know, there might be tax reasons why it would be appropriate to be in a form of legal entity as opposed to a sole proprietorship or some kind of unincorporated association or partnership. Uh, but but the, the uh, primary reason why most small businesses benefit from an organized legal structure is uh, liability protection. Okay, so uh, once you've decided that you need a legal entity, you need to understand the basic organizational structure of whichever entity you choose. Um, we're going to talk today primarily about LLCs and corporations because, as David mentioned, that's um, the corporate vehicle or the legal entity vehicle that works best for most of our clients. Um, so let's start with corporations. Uh, your formation document for a corporation is called Articles of Incorporation. Um, this, the Articles of Incorporation act almost like the constitution for the company. Um, 
they're more static, more difficult to amend. This is the document that you file with um, the Kentucky Secretary of State or whichever governmental entity is the proper filing office for um, in, in your particular state. Uh, in, in Kentucky, it's the Kentucky Secretary of State. Um, it just depends which state you are incorporating in. Your articles of incorporation are going to set out the number of shares that the corporation is authorized to issue. The initial directors, um, it will typically have a limitation on liability uh, provision for officers and directors of the corporation. Um, once those articles of incorporation are filed, uh, those initial directors will need to have, and it's required by statute, that they have an organizational meeting. And at that organizational meeting, the directors will adopt the bylaws of the corporation. Uh, the bylaws are essentially the internal governing document for a corporation. Um, these are more flexible and are not filed with any governmental entity in general. Um, as also at the organizational meeting, the directors will need to appoint officers for the company. Uh, the president, the vice president, secretary, treasurer, um, generally. Those are the typical officers. Um, and just as a general matter, corporations, the owners are called shareholders. Generally, the shareholders do not participate in the day-to-day -day management um, of the corporation. Corporations are overseen by the board of directors, and that board will delegate certain responsibilities to the officers of the corporation. Um, mostly that's laid out in the corporation's bylaws, or it can also be laid out in a resolution of the board, whether or not the board adopts that at a meeting or by written consent. The counterpart to the Articles of Incorporation for a limited liability company is a document called Articles of Organization. Um, just as with the Articles of Incorporation, this document is going to be filed with the Kentucky Secretary of State. Um, and is in general simpler um, in form than the Articles of Incorporation. With the Articles of Organization, the main decision that must be made is whether or not the LLC will be member managed or manager managed. Um, LLCs have members. Those members are the owners of the LLC or what you might think of as a shareholder in a corporation. Um, Generally, if an LLC is closely held, there are just a few owners and those owners are going to participate directly in the day-to-day -day management of the LLC. I generally recommend that the entity be member managed, but of course it depends, um, it's a case-by-case -case basis and each business is special and unique. Um, there of course could be a manager managed LLC, we do those often as well. Um, and you have to make that designation in your Articles of Organization. So that's really the main decision that you have to make when you're preparing your Articles of Organization. Um, managers do not have to be members of the LLC, but they can't be. Um, after those Articles of Organization are filed, you will want to have an organizational meeting just as you would with a corporation. Uh, the members and managers, if there are any, will have a meeting and adopt what's called an operating agreement. The operating agreement is the internal document, it's a contract essentially, uh, between the members, the managers if there are any, and the company. This operating agreement, the operating agreement can, can vary vastly in its provisions, but generally what you're going to see is tax provisions, um, discussing how the LLC will be taxed, which we will, we will discuss later in the program. Um, of course, you're going to make it clear that there's a limitation on liability in certain instances for the members and managers, generally indemnity protection for those members or managers and employees if there are any, um, and probably of primary importance to uh, most owners, the voting provisions, um, deciding what percentage of the membership interest will be needed to approve certain actions. Um, you may wish to have supermajority provisions for certain actions such as taking out loans above a certain amount, merging the company, dissolving the company, etc. Um, the good thing about the operating agreement is that it really does offer um, a large amount of flexibility um, in what you can put in there and it really can be tailored to each individual business's needs. Uh, our next topic is when do I need a legal entity and we're going to talk about this in, in two contexts. The first, a business that has uh, an individual owner 
and then a business that has more than one owner. So for a sole owner business, when do I need a legal entity? Uh, if you're a sole owner and and you're not going to have any formal legal structure, it's not necessary to have take affirmative actions to be a sole, what's known as a sole proprietorship. Uh, you just you know, open your doors and operate business. If you're the only owner of the assets needed or used in the operation of that business, it's a sole proprietorship and you're in existence. The disadvantage to that is that you are personally liable, as I talked about in, in the first section. The, the, the individual owner is personally liable for the, uh, the liabilities that arise in the operation of, of that business and you have no benefit of the liability shield that might be obtained uh, from operating in a, a formal legal structure that pursuant to Kentucky law would provide you from uh, liability protection uh, with respect to the liabilities that arise in the operation of that business. So if you want to achieve that, it, ideally what you would do is, is uh, form the legal entity prior to the commencement of operation of your business and then acquire all of the assets needed for the operation of that business. Uh, with by the by action of the legal entity, so the legal entity would acquire the assets and and, and operate whatever business uh, we're talking about. Um, the there are advantages uh, to being a sole unincorporated uh, sole proprietorship. One, you don't have any paperwork. Uh, there, there's there's no separate filing required in order to uh, engage in that kind of operation. There's no separate tax return, uh, either state or federal, that, that must be filed. So, so there are benefits. It's a, a lot easier to operate. The trade-off is you don't receive the liability protection associated with operation in a formal legal entity. Uh, it, to form a legal entity, you're looking at uh, tax obligations for the entity, even even for a pass-through entity, uh, which uh, is a, is a, a interesting creature of, of tax law, just because you have a legal entity doesn't mean you have a taxpayer in the eyes of the uh, federal government. But even in that case, there are some basic tax filings that are required uh, to be made by the operator of the business. So for example, in Kentucky, if you're a limited liability entity, you are subject to what's known as the Kentucky LLET, Limited Liability Entity Tax, uh, which for any entity is going to be a minimum of $175, but, uh, and, and then on top of that, to the extent you have uh, either receipts or profits in excess of threshold levels, you're looking at you know, potentially more taxes. Uh, and in, in, in addition to that layer of complexity, uh, an entity has to file an annual report uh, with the Secretary of State in Kentucky. Uh, and, uh, and then, then uh, it, it would it's it, it's it would behoove the operator of any entity to the extent the initial purpose of or goal in forming the entity was to maintain liability protection as I talked about in section one to observe corporate formalities so to the extent that's ever tested uh, in some effort of a third party to pierce the corporate veil uh, it will be upheld so there is a level of corporate formality that, that should be observed in the operation of the business as it moves forward. That's a level of complexity that just doesn't exist if you're, if you're operating in an unincorporated sole proprietorship. Uh, so there, there are advantages and disadvantages for the individual owner of a, of a business uh, uh, when looking at whether to operate a, a sole proprietorship or a, or a legal entity. If you have multiple owners, uh, of a business, if you just go into business, uh, it, what you probably are, if you do nothing else, is a partnership. Uh, in Kentucky and in most states, if if you just go into business with multiple owners, what is most likely the uh, the way that you would be treated under the law is as a partnership, a de, what's known as a de facto or a, a partnership by estoppel, and what that means is. Under Kentucky's law, in order to be a partnership, you have to go into business together with a common profit objective. Uh, and so 
that's what basically the description of an unincorporated business owned by more than one person would be. A couple people go into business, co-own some property uh, with, a, with a common profit objective. It's probably going to be a partnership. Well, what does that mean uh, under the law? What it means for purposes of the discussion we're having today is that the assets of each of those individual partners now are exposed uh, for the liabilities that arise in the operation of that business. Uh, and you might say, well, surely it's just half of the assets because I only stand to make half of the, the profits from the operation of this business. No, that's not the way it work, works. Each partner uh, is responsible jointly and severally uh, under, under most facts and circumstances for the liabilities that arise in the operation of that business. So if you got one Mr. Big uh, who's putting in all the capital required for the startup of a business and one hardworking person who's going to do the heavy lifting on the ground sweat work, uh, guess what? Somebody who wants to seek a recovery against the company and finds that there are no assets needed to satisfy that recovery is going to chase Mr. Big. Uh, and Mr. Big is going to face the prospect of um, uh, having to satisfy the uh, liabilities from the operation of that business in whole even though he or she might have only stood to benefit um, with respect to a part of the profit generated in the operation of that business. So um, that's typically uh, a, a disadvantage to operation as a partnership that many find unacceptable. There are other reasons why operation of a partnership uh, for, for many people uh, is an unacceptable uh, form of operation. And the, the primary other reason we, we find is that a partnership, uh, just by virtue of uh, authority granted to each partner under the law, each partner has the ability to bind the partnership without seeking the approval of the partners. So what did I just say? I said you, you could have multiple multiple people who go into business as a partnership. You could have two, you could have ten. Uh, either way, each individual partner has the authority to bind the partnership uh, without seeking counsel uh, of his, her, or its partners. And even, even where they, they might have some kind of agreement, written or verbal, between the partners as to the authority of an individual partner to transact business on behalf of the partnership, unless the third party with whom the business is being transacted has knowledge, actual knowledge, of the limitations on that partner's authority, in, in most cases, it, that, that will be no defense that could be asserted by the partnership to a liability created by an individual partner. So that's another disadvantage to operation as a, as a partnership that many people who come seek counsel from us find unacceptable, which, le which leads us to a discussion as to whether an entity might be, a, a, more, a, a different legal entity might be appropriate for the operation of that business. Uh, and, and, and so uh, the the advantages to acting as a partnership are a lot like the advantages to acting as a sole proprietorship. It's it's certainly uh, less complicated in terms of the formality that must be observed. Uh, you do have a you do have partnership uh, tax filings that must be made if you're a partnership. So there really isn't that kind of advantage. But uh, it, it, there's it, there's it's undoubted that there are it, it is a less complicated operation if you were to choose to do business as a partnership. Uh, it's just that there is a trade-off and the price you pay in addition uh, to losing the liability shield is the potential for each partner to deal with the world in a way that's not contemplated by the partnership as a whole and the partnership has to live with that. Okay, um, the last topic that we're going to cover today is what type of entity will work best for my business? And this is a question that really can't be answered in a vacuum. So 
what I've tried to show you and on this slide is that there are many different issues that need to be considered before this question can be answered. Um, the first and most often in the forefront of most people's minds are what are the tax considerations of these different types of entities. Um, we always recommend that a company starting out retain the services of an accountant and if at all possible consult with a tax attorney. Um, you're going to have your ownership issues. Who is going to own what percent? And to what extent will that person have a say in how the business is run on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, also, how much time do you have to devote to the types of corporate formalities that you would need to observe in order to preserve that limited liability shield that David talked about? Um, and also, you should also consider what are your future plans for the business? Do you intend to try to get investors or will you raise capital through loan, bank loans, for example? Um, all these things are some major considerations that have to be taken into account before uh, we could advise you or any attorney could advise you on the type of entity that would work best for you because, as I said, every business is unique. Uh, I am going to talk a little bit about the general tax differences um, among the different types of entities. Um, we get questions uh, like this all the time. Um, so, in general, um, a corporation will, by default, if you take no affirmative action, a corporation will be taxed as what's known as a C corporation. Um, C corporations have du double tax liability. This means that the corporation's income will be taxed first at the corporate level, and then when that income is distributed to the shareholders, it will be taxed again um, at the shareholder level. Uh, if the corporation is able to meet certain statutory requirements that are laid out in the tax code, um, that corporation can elect to be taxed as an S corporation. Um, the, the advantage to that is that an S corporation is a pass-through entity, meaning that there is no corporate level tax. Um, all the income and the loss will pass through directly to the shareholders. Uh, however, not every corporation can qualify for S corporation status and there are various requirements and those requirements relate to, for example, the number of shareholders, um, the types of shareholders, and the different classes of stock that, the S, that an S-corporation can have. Um, uh, with respect to limited liability companies, if there is just one member of the limited liability company, that will be by default taxed as a disregarded entity, meaning that there really is no tax on the LLC level and that LLC is disregarded for tax purposes. Um, an LLC with more than one member will be by default taxed as a partnership. Um, there are, of course, there, there is the ability for an LLC to be taxed as an S corporation if it meets the requirements that I mentioned earlier and um, it makes that affirmative election to be taxed as an S corporation. Um, and also an LLC may be taxed as a C corporation if it makes that election. Um, and at least in my practice, I often get questions about the difference between an S corporation and a partnership for tax purposes because most of the time when you're advising an LLC, those are their two primary options um, for um, tax status. Um, so you can see here that I've laid out a couple of the general differences. Um, and what I think is most important probably of all of these that people are most interested in is um, that profits from S corporations are not subject to self-employment taxes while profits from an LLC taxed as a partnership are sometimes subject to self-employment taxes. So, you know, again, I think the, the take home from this is that it's always a good idea to talk with an accountant or a tax attorney before you make a decision with respect to what type of entity you're going to choose. Thank you so much for joining us for webinar one of the seminar series, Planning for the Future of Your Business. Next time we will discuss employment law issues that may arise in the operation of your small business. On this slide you can see David and I's contact information. Feel free to call us or email us with any questions you may have about today's webinar.